Thank you everyone for attending and to our online audience. Uh, today we have Dr. Carolyn Sperry. She's an associate professor in the School of Mechatronic Systems Engineering at Simon Fraser University and a principal investigator at i -Cord. Carolyn pursued engineering on the advice of a high school aptitude test, having never met an engineer. She completed a degree in mechanical engineering at the University of Waterloo and her master's degree from the University of British Columbia and her PhD in mechanical engineering at the University of California, Berkeley followed by a postdoctoral fellowship in the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Sperry applies engineering theories and new technologies to injury prevention, as well as diagnostic and treatment strategies tailored to individual patients. An active collaborator, Dr. Sperry connects research advances to the real world through education, industry partnerships, clinical collaborations, and public engagement. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, you guys. So I'm going to, uh, we're having some technology limitations, so I'm going to walk around with this microphone right up at my face the whole time. I've been told it has to stay right in front of me, so if you see me doing this, just give me a wave so that the people online can, can uh, hear. All right, so what I'm going to talk about today is some research that I've done around um, fall protection. So that's the safety systems that people wear while they're on a job site. Uh, and particularly looking at the role of a few different factors in how these fall protection systems perform. So, um, the real motivating thing behind this, falls are, you know, they're not particularly common, but when they occur, they're catastrophic. And so the, the risk reward or the, the uh, risk benefit is, is quite high on the risk side of things when you're doing that analysis. There have been numerous stories about uh, workers dying on the job site as a result of falls, typically in construction. So 6% of all work fa workplace fatalities are a result of falls. 45% um, of those workplace fatalities are occurring on the job site, uh, on the construction sites. And most of the time that's due to a couple of things. Either the fall protection fails or the people don't use fall protection at all. So there's very few occurrences where fall protection used correctly for the setting that it was designed for in the most correct way will let you down. It will hurt you. It's, it's not comfortable to have a fall. The, the fall protection is not made to be a pillow. It'll hurt you, but it'll at least stop you from starting to crash on the ground. Um, one of the things that flagged for me in, in starting to look at this line of research was particularly this um, story about the worker in Toronto. The worker fell from a, a 56, I believe, story building and was found on the adjacent building, the roof of the adjacent building, 22 stories lower. Uh, the worker was wearing fall protection, uh, and the lanyard or the part that connects the worker to the building is what failed. And it's thought that, I haven't seen the final report, it's thought that um, the roof flashing on the edge of the building when the worker went over the edge just sliced through the lanyard. So the worker thought they were doing everything correct, and then it ends up that they still end up with, with a uh, fatal accident because of something that wasn't really thought of in the whole fall protection scheme. The right way. Um, so fall protection, when do you need it? Why do you need it? You need it any time there's a fall risk greater than three meters. Right? or any time there's a risk of injury greater than impacting a flat surface. So you could be even just two meters, six feet-ish, off the ground, and if you are falling onto something that can hurt you more than a flat surface, you still need fall protection. Okay? So three meters, 10 feet, that means technically anybody that's working on their roof at home, single-story bungalow building, should be wearing fall protection. Right? Any construction worker that's working on anything above a one-story building should be wearing fall protection. Okay. Uh, peak forces in fall protection are supposed to be limited to eight kilonewtons. So what that means is how much force the body can be exposed to during a fall. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. What does a typical fall arrest system look like? Well, it's got three key components. It has a safety harness, right? And it used to be you could wear these safety belts and assorted sort of lower half things. No, now it's full system. So it has to cover, come from the shoulders, go around the chest. It has a D-ring up at the back. That's where your lanyard connects. So that's the next part of the fall protection. That lanyard ties you in to wherever you're trying to be. Most of the time, this lanyard has some sort of energy absorbing capabilities. If you have a wire rope or even a, a, you know, a strong nylon rope, whatever polyester rope, if that rope has no flex in it, if you fall the, the length of this rope, you're going to break your pelvis. You're going to break your spine if that rope doesn't have energy-absorbing capabilities. You will be well over that 8 kilonewton allowed threshold. 
The last part is you've got to have an anchorage. So you've got to have a spot that's strong enough to hold you when you fall. Okay? So you've got these three components. Here's another sort of indicator of that system in a slightly different way. So one of the challenges is when you're looking at building new construction, when you are at the leading edge, the top of the building, there's nothing above you to tie into. There's nowhere to put your anchor because it's the sky. Right? So you've got to then tie in to somewhere below you. That gives you the potential for an even greater fall. Right? So what does an energy absorbing lanyard look like? I, I put some pictures up here and for the people online you can see those. Um, in class here I can also show you, I brought some physical examples that you are welcome to pass around. So we have a whole bunch of different types of lanyards. There's this bungee style one. There's what's called a pack type lanyard and that's what's up on the screen here. Um, this is, the one on the screen is a coil pack, and this is just a folded pack, okay? And then there is this other similar pack, just a different brand. So there's different colors, there's different styles. Um, and really, at the end of the day, they're all rated to do the same thing, right? They should save you in the same way. They're just, it's up to personal preference. So when you're a worker on a job site, depending on whether you supply your own equipment or whether your union supplies it for you, if your union supplies it, you'll walk into the job site and there'll be a trailer full of equipment and all these things will be hanging up and it's your job to go in and pick one. Okay? So, and you can choose from any of these different systems available. The iron workers, they have in their training facilities, they have the same thing, a, a closet where all their fall protection equipment is hanging out. Of these three systems, so this yellow guy, the black guy, and that bungee one going around, which one do you think people would prefer? Why? <laughs> you know what? That's pretty much exactly what they do. Right? They pick the bungee, two reasons. One, it's yellow. Looks, looks safe. Yellow looks safe. Right? And the other is it's shorter. Right? So it's, it's like a, having like a bungee dog leash or something, right? That you still have that six feet of range, but when you're not at the end of the six foot range, you don't have this big loop hanging underneath you. Right? It, it sort of shrinks down into about a four foot length. So most of, the, most of the workers would pick the bungee lanyard. We're going to find out pretty soon that that's, that's not the best choice. Um, the other part I want to show you is how these things work. Right? So that black one, this black folded um, pack, when it fall, when you fall, it starts to pull apart. Right? And what you can see, you can see it on the screen, is on the, the uh, lower image, right? that to absorb energy, what happens is it's effectively like a Velcro material. There's two pieces of material that are stitched together. And as the person falls, the stitches rip out. And they're calibrated in such a way that they always rip at the same force. And I don't know how much you guys know about engineering, physics, or otherwise, but force times distance equals energy. So if you tear these stitches out at a constant force, and you're doing it over a distance, so depending on the rating of the lanyard, 1.2 to 1.75 meters worth of distance, that's the maximum energy absorbing capability of the lanyard. If, you, you, if your fall has more energy than that, you've bottomed out the lanyard and now you're in a real big problem. Okay? So that's, these things, they tear apart, which also means they're one-time use. Right? So once you've torn this apart, that's it. You can't, you can't use it again. It doesn't get put back together. One of the things that you have to do as someone using fall protection is you have to inspect your equipment. And there's... On each of these pieces of equipment, there's safety tags that tell you how to use the equipment and who, should, who it's made for and all that sort of stuff, what its ratings are. Um, every day, before you put on your fall protection, you're supposed to look through your whole entire lanyard, look through your harness, make sure there's no damage to it. May not have been your system the day before if you're pulling it from a trailer full of equipment. May have been your system the day before, but maybe whatever your significant other splattered paint on it that, while you were sleeping, I don't know. right? cut it by accident or maybe on purpose. You need to check, right? And check every part of that and make sure there's no damage to it. Um, inspected by a qualified person before each work shift. That means the person that's using the system, they have to go through training before they're allowed to use fall protection. Has to be kept free from substances and conditions that could contribute to its deterioration. That is a lovely vague statement that doesn't have a lot of stuff to back it up. Um, and maintained in good working order. Again, a fairly vague statement when you think about it. And so what we wanted to do was start to look at specifically what these meant and what their implications were. 
So what does it mean to be free from substances and conditions? What if they're not? And how does that affect the performance of the lanyards? Um, so how I got into this whole line of work, this was my pre-professor life. Um, while I was a grad student uh, down in California, I spent a lot of time doing accident reconstruction and injury analysis um, and looking at dynamics of falls and impacts. And when I got up to SFU here, one of the things I wanted to do was look at how to apply these techniques to keeping people safe, improving health. So what can we learn from understanding dynamics of falls and impacts to uh, improve overall safety? So what we did when, uh, when we first started working in this field, I got this awesome new piece of equipment when I got here, uh, and so I wanted to use it. So I started putting these things into this mechanical test system. What it does is it pulls the lanyard apart. Right? So it does it in a very carefully controlled way. The mechanics are beautifully calibrated down to the you know, one one thousandth of a millimeter precision. The problem is it doesn't go fast enough, and it doesn't go um, long enough. So the maximum stroke distance, this giant machine that you see on the screen, um, the maximum stroke distance is 13 centimeters. Right? This thing can deploy, these lanyards can deploy 1.75 meters. Right? So we're, not, we're only testing a very tiny component, uh, component of that. So we coupled that with our rigid body dynamic simulations, and the whole thing came together to show us and tell us that we need to do this in a dynamic way. We can't do simulation that's sufficient to capture this. We can't do these controlled mechanical tests in a way that's sufficient to capture it. So we need to do dynamic testing. And that, in doing that dynamic testing, we wanted to answer some specific questions. The first one being, given all these very vague guidelines about you need to inspect your equipment and do something with it, but what exactly are you even inspecting for? And when is it time to take it out of service? So we wanted to look at how does environmental exposure tool damage, or contact with worksite structures affect the performance of these shock-absorbing lanyards. And so in order to test these, the way that industry tests these, these technologies, we needed a drop test, right? And if you look at the CSA standards for this technology, it gives you this picture, right? This is a drop test. Looks very simple. Here's a drop mass. Has to be 1,000 kilo, er, 1,100 kilograms, right? There's a hoist cable that will lift your drop mass up and down, so you can use some sort of winch system, lift the thing up, and then you need a quick release to let it go so that the, the mass will drop. And you need to put an anchor point at the top and an energy absorber in the middle. So we looked at this and we were like, great, no problem, we can do this, totally do this, right? How hard can this be to make a structure that does that? It's this hard. So <laughs> you... <laughs> The, the diagram made it look so simple, and then when you actually get down to the reality of it, what you need is nine meters of height clearance in order to drop these things in a reliable way. You need a structure that has a certain frequency and stiffness to it, so that when you're taking these precise measurements, you're actually precisely measuring the lanyard and not vibration in the structure or in the tower or something else. Um, clearly, it, I don't know how many of you guys have been out to SFU. This is not something we have at SFU. They don't have a giant yard where we can do this. Um, so this is BCIT, actually. Um, and this is the iron workers' facilities at BCIT. This tower was not designed to be a drop tower. This tower was designed to hold up this post so that the iron workers can learn how to climb a post. Right? So their job is to climb posts, because when they're building a building, right, they've got to be able to move around the frame of the building. They don't have a, an elevator to move them around wherever they need to go. So they need to be able to climb up and down this vertical post themselves wearing their fall protection, but still they need to get up and down that post. So we took advantage of the fact that that structure was there. We engineered some cross bracing and, and did some calculations to make sure the structure was stiff enough. Um, eventually, in the first iteration we didn't have this, eventually in the, uh, the second iteration of testing we put in this platform here, so I'm pointing for the people online here, um, because what we were using initially when we were starting our drop test was a boom lift. So it was a crane that you had to wheel up, a, a crane on wheels, so you would drive it up to the side of the tower, extend out the crane, hook up your test specimen, pull the crane back out of the way, drop your test, and then start again. Right? So it took, it took quite a long time to do each test. So we finally got this structure put together. And here you can see, so we welded on a flange um, so that we can connect our test equipment. And this thing right here is a very precise load cell. So it's measuring all the forces that are being applied through the, uh, through the, the lanyard as we're doing our tests. Well, let me show you what a 
tests look like. Let's hope these videos are actually going to play. So this is the top cross brace of the system. We're coming down. Here's our mass that we've just pulled up, 100 kilograms. Right? We've got our, of course, we've got our GoPros all over the place, taking, taking angles of all of this. There's our load cell. So it's capturing the data. And then our anchorage, so that anchorage is approved and, and rated for uh, what the test needs to be. You can see the boom lift in the side here. So that's us getting ourselves all set up. And then we pull the, the quick release cable and it, uh, and it will drop the, the mask. Well, first, it will safely get out of the way. So this is, yeah, I, you can tell, right? This took a long time. Every test we did, it took quite a while. But, uh, once we got ourselves out of the way, then we could pull the quick release. Right? And that's, so that's a safely deployed lanyard, right? A nice straight line drop. You're not running into anything. You're not going over any edges. And you can see in the, uh, right here, you can see now the deployed lanyard, right? So that webbing started to tear out. Uh, it didn't bottom out. So it didn't go all the way to the point where the white webbing has torn fully apart. Um, so it's stopped the falling mask before it ran out of capacity to stop it. Okay. So that's, it did what it was supposed to do in conclusion. So that was fun and all, but you know, engineers like to break stuff. That's, that's sort of where our bread and butter is. We break stuff and then understand how, we, how it breaks. right? And then we make new systems so it doesn't break. Uh, so what we wanted to do was look at the effect of tool damage on these lanyards. So what happens when you give these lanyards to a bunch of welding students and iron workers, leave them alone with them for two weeks in their welding booths, they get exposed to everything. So plasma torches, tools that are cutting. In this case, the red part you can see, that's UV damage um, from the, the different tools they use. And so then once they were damaged, then we put them through the same tests again. So we damaged lanyards, 15 different lanyards, and looked at, at uh, what the effect was of that damage. So you look at this cross-section of, of damaged specimens here, and these images are the worst damage on each of the, the uh, lanyards. How many of these things do you think failed? Right, I got an all of them. Three, which three? Do you, you have favorites? First, second, and fourth. These ones? Yeah, each one of them is, so there's 15 different lanyards altogether. Okay, number six, yeah. All right, so we got a lot, we got a lot of good guesses. We got so somebody saying all of them. We got some one, two, three, and six. Got a few different, so you can see there's some pretty extreme cuts here, right? Number three was cut almost three quarters of the way through the webbing. Purposely cut with, I don't know, tin snips or something. Right? This is what happens when you leave students with equipment and then come back two weeks later. It's, uh, got, it got pretty damaged. So here's an example of our test. I appreciate that. I had to mute this video because that's exactly what I did too. <gasps> oh my god. Right? But you see how quick and sudden and catastrophic that is, right? And this is so if you watch really carefully as this slow motion video goes, this blue part, that's the energy absorber. The energy absorber did nothing, didn't deploy at all in this failure. Right? So dropping the mass, it just catastrophically failed. Okay? So it's a, it's a good visual. It's very impactful. We had iron worker students like, being trained in how to do this stuff standing around watching these tests, which of course is then great when they all gasp and go, oh my god, because they thought for sure that as soon as they put on their fall protection, they were just going to be safe. That was the end of it. Um, and that's not the reality of it. Fall protection is one component of it. Putting it on is one component of it. Making sure it fits, making sure your leg loops are tight and your shoulder straps are tight, making sure you're using the right equipment in the right space, making sure your space around you is safe so that if you did fall, you're not going to just bounce off a steel beam. Right? You want to have a, a fall clearance. So all of these factors start to come in. However, the interesting part was only two of those 15 damaged lanyards failed. Right? And the two that failed were the ones that had high plasma, high temperature plasma torch damage. So that one that was cut three quarters of the way through the webbing, it was okay. Right? Um, but the ones, the, the black one that had plasma torch damage and the top right, or top left, I guess, the uh, the 
first one also had plasma torch damage, and those that melted fiber got really brittle and really weak, and that's what failed. Okay. So I am in no way, by the results of this, advocating that you know three quarters of a cut through a lanyard, you should look at that and say, oh, that's perfectly safe. Let's use it anyways. Right. Uh, but what it suggests is that we don't really have a good idea about the impact of what the damaged lanyards, how they're going to perform. And part of that is the standards for industry are they test all of their lanyards brand new out of the package and that's it. They never have to think about how is this thing going to hold up over time? It's exposed to UV, it's got some weld splatter on it, whatever other things. Well, how's it going to perform then? And do, does it need to have a certain resistance to these different things? Right? Um, so the other interesting thing is if it didn't fail, the lanyard didn't fail, then damage pretty much had no effect. So it didn't change any of the mechanics of the fall. It didn't change the fall distance. It didn't change the exposure forces. And that's because the, the forces are limited by the energy absorber. So as long as you didn't bottom out your lanyard, you were fine. There was also no difference overall in the different styles. So whether you used a bungee lanyard or whether you used a pack type lanyard, the average forces were the same. The average deployment distance was the same. The only thing that was different is this one, this one yellow lanyard that I held up earlier. Um, it looks the same, right? It's all the other lanyards. It's yellow. Some of them are black. But otherwise, it looks generally the same. Until you read this little label on the side, which says it rated for 6 feet and 900 pounds. Those are not metric units. That's not a CSA. This is an American system. And actually, when we ordered all of these things from the manufacturer in order to do this testing, they themselves mixed up some ANSI, so American rated lanyards, in with our package of CSA rated lanyards. So they look exactly the same, right? But there's a really big difference in how they perform. So both of the systems are rated to 4 kilonewtons or 900 pounds, right? And ish, you know, your conversion is pretty much 900 pounds to 4 kilonewtons. But how they work is different. So the Canadian system is rated to a maximum load of 4 kilonewtons. That in reality means that most of the systems work at 65 to 85% of that. The American system is rated to have an average 4 kilonewtons, not a maximum. So most of their systems have a maximum of about 5 kilonewtons and an average deployment force of 4. So that means they're going to deploy in different ways. They're going to, the American ones are going to absorb more energy per length. Right, the length of terror. So these are important things to pay attention to. If, if your fall protection engineer has designed a fall system assuming certain performance metrics of your lanyard, and then you sub in a different one, it's going to give you a different outcome potentially. So the other thing we wanted to look at, so that kind of got the, the initial start of damage and, and its effect out of the way. Now we wanted to look at sharp edge and leading edge contact. So particularly, this is the, the reality for iron workers and others that are working towards the top edge of the building, right? or if you're working on the roof of a building, that you're going to, if you fall, you're going to go over an edge. And when you go over an edge, then your lanyard is going to wrap that edge. Right? And it's going to have contact. You're not just dropping straight down like I was showing you with the first drop test. Right? So you're going to drop. If you fall off an edge here, right? you're going to fall over the edge, and then your lanyard is going to hit that edge right? as you fall down the side. The other important thing to note here is when you see this guy standing on the beam, you can see the fall protection is anchored in his D-ring here, but by necessity it has to be tied at his feet. Right? So what that means, if you have a standard lanyard, is you now have the length of the lanyard, 6 feet, right, 1.8 meters, plus whatever the distance is between where the lanyard is anchored and where it attaches. That's your total free fall distance now. Right? Because if this person falls, and when they get to here, when their D-ring is level here, they haven't actually used up any of this length yet. Right? But they're already falling and moving pretty quick. And now they still have this full distance of, of lanyard length to keep going. Right? So what this guy is using is what's called a self-retracting, SRL. Um, and what that does, self-retracting lanyard, it's like those um, the dog leashes where you can spool it out to like 16 feet, but then you can press the lock and stop your little dog from running away. Right? So it does the same thing, but it does it automatically, so you don't have to stop yourself in the middle of the fall. Um, it detects if you're falling, if it's spooling out too fast, and it'll lock and grab. So it'll stop you before you get to that 12-foot free fall. These are really expensive. So unless your company is paying for it, more often than not, you're not choosing that. 
right? You're choosing these cheaper systems. So something like this, most of these lanyards are going to cost you somewhere between $150 and $300, depending on the style you pick. Um, these self-retracting systems are going to cost you more in the 1000 and up range. Okay. So, of course, if, if you have the money to pay it, you're going to say, of course, I'm going to pick the SL, uh, SL, SRL because that's going to save my life if I fall. But if that's two weeks worth of work for you or three weeks worth of work for you, then you would love to make that choice, but you may not be able to. You have to provide your own equipment. All right, so again, we're back to these iron workers and how they're going to fall. So the, the previous picture I showed you, that's a potential 12-foot free fall. Here, if you're sitting on the beam, you've lowered your center of gravity and, and your anchorage point. Now you're more at a potential 9-foot free fall or 2.8 meters, right? And so this is where we started our test. We were trying to be not overly harsh on testing the equipment, but re realistic and practical. And so this is my nice stick figure diagram of edge testing. So what happens when you go over an edge, right? Your lanyard is anchored somewhere. Depending where it is will dictate your free fall distance. So if it's anchored well in from the edge of the roof, you don't have as much free fall distance. You also don't have as much freedom to move. If it's anchored closer to the edge, or like when you're on a beam and the beam is only 12 inches wide, you're, by default you're close to the edge. So then you have a, a longer free fall distance. So we set up, we modified our, our test structure, and instead of doing a straight drop now, we do a straight drop of the mast, but the lanyard is connected, the anchorage point is now off to the side, over here, there's our load cell tucked in here, and then our, our lanyard is going to wrap this edge and come down. And you can see the two bolts here, we made these interchangeable plates, so we could change the sharpness of the edge to simulate whether it's a nice old rounded beam like what was on this structure to begin with, or if it's a fresh cut beam, that edge is going to be a lot sharper. Right? So we were changing out the different sharpness. So let's see what happens here. Any, any predictions what's going to happen here? Going to go over the edge? Is it going to, is it going to be okay or is it not going to be okay? Yeah, don't, don't you vote. Don't skew it. <laughs> Got a couple people thinking it's going to be okay. You got a whole bunch of people not 100% sure. That's okay. That, that's about where you should be, right? Not 100% sure. So then you'd err on the side of caution, hopefully. All right. So what's going to happen here? Down goes our drop mass. You can watch our energy absorber start to deploy. So what happened here? You can see this catastrophic failure. This was, we were simulating a nine foot free fall. We were simulating it with a, what's called an E4 lanyard, or sorry, E6 lanyard. So these are rated for heavier workers, right? And in which case we have to test it with a heavier weight. So we're testing with 160 kilos now. Because it's a nine foot free fall, it used up all of the energy absorbing capability of the system and then bottomed out. When you hit that bottoming out point, the load goes from that nice constant six or four kilonewtons, depending which system you're using, and it spikes. In some of the cases, it'll spike 20 kilonewtons at that last load because it's got to suddenly stop you. Instead of having this nice deployable system, it's got to stop you only with the stretch in the webbing itself, which is not very much. So suddenly you get this spike of load at the end, and that catastrophically shears the, the uh, lanyard. So I brought that one in so you can take a look at you know, just how sudden and quick these things get ripped apart. Yes. So with a round edge, if we were testing on the, the nice, you know, this tower has been in place for, I think, about 12 years. Um, and if we were testing on this nice, weather-worn 12-year-old beam, no problem. Right? But on a fresh-cut edge, it's a, it's a pretty significant problem. Here's the other one. So this is the, uh, this is the favorite right, of the iron workers. They love these bungee lanyards. They look cool. They keep out of the way. You know, they're yellow, so they're extra safe. And this is, this is what's going to happen with this guy. So you could see what was happening, right, with the bungee, and, and it will uh, come around again for you. So the bungee is getting caught up on that edge. 
right? And instead of sliding nicely over the edge, which is what it would need to do in order to let you fall safely, it's getting caught up and then it's getting sort of sheared or, or sliced at these increments as it goes over the edge, right? And so because the absorber is integrated, instead of being like these ones where you've got this nice package of energy absorber, right? This is the part that's going to deploy, not the rest of it, not the rest of it. Right? Whereas in the bungee lanyard, the energy absorber is all the way along the whole length of the thing. So if you damage any point along the length, you've damaged and disrupted the energy absorbing capabilities of the length. Right? And so now you've got this catastrophic outcome. The other thing I want you to see as you're watching this end of the fall, watch what happens to the drop mass. Yeah, these things are heavy and they're clunky. Sorry about that. Um, watch what happens to the drop mass if you're looking at the vertical view. So as the thing fails, now you've got spinning, you've got it going off to one side. We actually stopped the video here because that thing shattered the wood planks that were there. It went right through the wood planks, sent wood flying everywhere. We all went kind of running for our lives. Um, this is important to note, right? It, it's very rare in an actual fall situation that you're going to find, oh, I've got this nice straight column and I'm just going to like step off the edge one step and drop straight down like I'm soldier diving into the swimming pool. You're going to be twisting and turning and swinging and all of these things can come into play that even if your, your fall protection works, you've got to watch out for all the other things around you. So what we found at the end of this, in total 21 of 114 lanyards failed during the testing, right? and 19 of the 21 failures were due to the sharp edge contact. Um, so they had to, the rounded edge Two of the lanyards failed, but it was sharp edge that cut through most of them. So if you have an old weather-worn beam, you're, you're not going to have as big of a problem. Right? Um, we had a bunch of different conditions where things went wrong. Right? Particularly, we found that the bungee lanyards um, and, the, and a couple of the coil pack lanyards failed even when we were being really sort of conservative in our testing. We only did a six-foot free fall. Right? Um, if we're doing these, what's typical of an edge test, we do more like a nine foot free fall. When we did the nine foot or 2.8 meter free fall, all of the E4s, all of the ones that were rated for the sort of average mass person, which is 45 to 115 kilos, right? You were wearing one of those and you went off a, an edge, all of them failed, right? If you had the heavier rated ones, more of them were okay, right? It, not, not many, still six out of the eight failed, right? But there, we're, still, we're getting uh, better outcomes. We tried a couple of interventions because, you know, the first thing we want to do is stop these things from failing. So this is what an iron worker actually uses um, when they're on the field. They take high pressure hose line, they cut it, put a slice in it, and they put it over the sharp edge where they think they're going to fall, if they, if they would fall, where their lanyard would contact, right? It's an it's a extra way to protect it. The problem is it's rubbery and grippy. And as I showed you with the bungee lanyards, when they go over the edge, if they can't smoothly slide over the edge, if there's friction holding them there, it stops the, the energy absorber from deploying properly. It stops the lanyard from working properly. And we found that with the E4 lanyards, three out of the four of them failed when we used this hose softener. So we actually made things as bad or worse than just having the bare sharp edge. Right? We tried this other intervention, which is a sleeve wrap. This was made for um, rope access work. So when you're actually purposefully using a rope to hang yourself at a work site to, to reach and access things, if your rope is going to wrap an edge, then you put this sleeve protector on it. It's 35 bucks. Put the sleeve protector on. You run your rope down the middle of the sleeve protector, and then you don't have that same friction. Right? And, and it doesn't get caught up on the sharp edge. When we use this $35 wrap sleeve, nothing failed. If you, I'm going to pass this one around too. You can see the cuts where the sharp edge cut into it, um, but it didn't fail the lanyard. Right? So there's some pretty simple interventions you could use to get some better outcomes. So what's the point of all of this? Well, a couple of things. One, we spend all this time being focused on weld splatter and paint specs and all that stuff that could potentially damage your lanyard, when in fact the thing that's a greater risk based on our testing is going over an edge. Right? That, that's where you really need to show emphasis, and there is no consideration for that in the standards right now. So they, it's not even mentioned. Right? Um, so we need standards to, for, to figure out how energy absorbing lanyards work in these leading edge and sharp edge applications. Right? Um, the other part is manufacturers require these annual inspections of fall protection 
Right? You've got to send your equipment back in to keep it certified. You've got to send it back in, and they will do a, a checklist for you. And then they'll send you back a report that either says, fine, keep using it, or, oops, sorry, you've got damage, and you have to replace it. Right? A bit of a conflict of interest, because typically you send it back to the people that are going to sell you more. So you know, always, always a little bit sketchy, but they don't have, nobody has quantified criteria. So everybody's using their own kind of, you send it to different companies, they have different criteria for when to take things out of service. So what we're starting to do is show at the extreme range that these things are more durable than we may have thought. And now we, we need to get more into the details about how specifically damage affects performance. The other thing that came out of all this work is we started talking with, uh, some of this work was funded by WorkSafe BC. And when we started talking with them and showing them our work, they said, hold on, do you know about our guidelines? I said, okay, no, we, we sort of know about the guidelines, but we know mostly about the regulation, right? So when you read the regulation related to fall protection, it says that your equipment has to use for fall protection, has to consist of compatible and suitable components, has to be sufficient to support the fall or, or, and arrest the forces, and has to meet the CSA or ANSI standard, right? When you, so that's, that's what most of the, um, fall protection engineers are working with, right? When you read the guidelines, though, they get a little bit more clear. And this was a really eye-opening thing for us because we're working with, my, the partners on this project were uh, a consulting engineer who designs fall protection systems and the steel trades program at BCIT who trains the iron workers and steel workers who are going to go up on these buildings and teaches them fall protection, right? And what none of us were aware of was in this guideline if you have any of the conditions that we were testing for, it really recommends that you should be using wire rope. You shouldn't be using these lanyards at all, right? Nobody is doing this. Nobody's following this process. So the big outcome of all of this was to say, uh, WorkSafe BC, we need to make sure people know about this. That's the trainers. That's the people that are using the systems. That's people that are designing the systems. We need to develop a bulletin and remind workers and employers how to work in these specific situations. So there's a big part of, there's a lot of knowledge out there, whether it's research, whether it's regulations and, and work, people in the workplace. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge out there, and there's a lot of gaps in the translation. So making sure that the knowledge is with the people that need it the most is one of the biggest challenges of all of this. Okay. Nope. So what next? Well, for us... There's a few different things. The first one is um, understanding, So, and this is well outside of my area of expertise now. I'm an engineer. I like to break things. I like to look at mechanics. I like to put things back together, design systems. But one of the biggest challenges is figuring out why don't people use fall protection? When they know they should, and I, I'm sure all of you have seen this, driving around Vancouver somewhere, go past a, a residential construction site. Take a look. Just pause for 10 seconds and look. How many people are using fall protection? I will bet you more often than not zero, right? I watched my neighbor across the road. They built a, a two-story house. The roof is somewhere about 30 feet off the ground. Tile, roof, in the rain, in the winter. The workers are up there, no fall protection. I close the curtain so the kids don't have to watch somebody get catastrophically injured, right? Um, there's a lot of challenges. It's behavioral, it's equipment, it's technology, it's, it's understanding regulations, it's enforcement. There's a whole bunch of parts that all have to come together to make this work. Um, and from the equipment side, one of the challenges is having things that will actually work on residential construction. Right? You have a plywood roof on a building or a particle board roof on a building. You put an anchor on that and fall off the roof and pull on that anchor, you're going to tear it right out of the roof and keep falling. Right? So you need to have reinforcing structures. That's got to be in the plan. It's got to be in the building plan somewhere. It's really hard to go back and retrofit those sorts of things in. Right? So those are some of the things that we're looking at now and, and working with our, our partners to sort out. Um, the other part is to look at the whole system. Right? So CSA standards dictate you have to test each of the parts individually. So you test the harness, you test the lanyard, you test the anchorage. But when you go on a job site, you have to use all three. Right? You've got to piece them all together. And the, th the combination of the three can do different things. It's not just a one plus one plus one is three, right? It's, it's not a linear addition. So depending how these systems interact with each other and work can change how um, the whole system protects a worker. And the last part is, and, and this is, uh, you know, being the, for the longest time, being the one female in my entire department of, 
of mechatronic systems engineering. Um, it reminds me that sometimes we don't think about the diversity of the people that are going to be using these systems. So all of these fall protection ratings, the 8 kilonewton exposure that's allowed and all that stuff, that was all derived off the sort of 50th percentile male, 25-year-old military guy doing parachute testing back in the 50s. Right? That's where all these standards come from. Because you're not allowed to test like that anymore. Right? You can't, you can't throw someone off a building and see what their forces are and whether their spine breaks. Like, that's not a thing. Um, but the military in the 50s, they, they did some stuff. Um, so we take advantage of those numbers. But the problem is, what does that mean for, say, a 50-year-old woman who's 110 pounds, 5 foot nothing, is a smoker, so her bones aren't great, and she's going to fall in the same way using the same equipment that was designed for a 25-year-old super strong young guy. Right? So looking at how the user and the stature of the user can inter interact with the fall protection systems and, and uh, safety. So those are the things we're working on now. The last plug I wanted to stick in here before I open it up for questions. Um, if you see anywhere and you're out in your life, you're walking around, you see unsafe things happening, WorkSafe BC has a prevention line, 24 hours, seven days a week, you can just call and report something. They will come and find it. They, I, as I was talking with their enforcement officers, one of their challenges is they don't know where to look for all of these things, right? They can't go up and down every side street looking for residential construction and finding where these things are happening. If you see it happening and you call it in, you're doing them a favor, right? And you're helping them out and you're helping the workers out. Oftentimes, the workers would love to be safe, and it's a combination of they're feeling peer pressure, they're feeling pressure from their supervisors, they're trying to be as fast as they can, and so some of the things get slotted. So thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the, uh, we had a bunch of funders. Uh, all of these experiments were done actually with undergrad students, so um, just as, you, as you're thinking like, ah, oh, I don't know what, what I'm going to do with my life, even undergrads were helpful back in the day. Um, doing all of these drop tests, they were, I had to select them based on height because I needed people that could reach really far to hook all these things up. Um, but they did, uh, they did a great job and have, have uh, resulted in some really interesting work. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sperry. So I will start by taking some um, questions from our online audience, and then um, we'll circulate around here if you um, guys have questions. So um, so the first question that was asked from um, one of our um, remote listeners was uh, about extreme temperatures. So this is Alec Lee asking, have you tested performance of fall arrest systems in extremely cold temperatures, for example, minus 20 degrees and lower? So we haven't. Um, as you can see from some of those videos, we, we were testing on uh, some really soggy, wet, rainy days. It was awesome because from, from uh, the picture that you can see on the screen, the Discovery Channel actually came and was filming some of our drop testing to make a little segment. And they, of course, came on the coldest, wettest November day it could possibly do. It was terrible. Um, but it did not go to minus 20. There is some other research, though, that has tested that. And it does have an effect um, on the performance of the lanyards. It, it, doesn't do, um, it doesn't cause catastrophic failures, but it certainly changes the mechanics of the, of the weather. I'm just going to keep going with um, the remote listeners. They've been quite active. So second question is from Peter Griffin asking, um, has there been any testing with wire rope lanyards? Uh, there has, not ours. Um, so we, that, is, that is one of the next steps of what we're doing. Um, the, the challenge with wire rope lanyards is you then, you still, in order to be safe, you have to integrate these energy absorbers, right? Um, and so then you get two components. You've got the wire rope lanyard and then the integrated or the coupled energy absorber that you package in. Um, so that will be uh, the part, of, part of some of our next proposals and uh, looking for more money to do more, more drop tests. 
Um, there's another question on this side. Um, so we have a question asking uh, that you, recognizing that you've made a very important point about the standards not matching um, the current workforce diversity. And uh, the question asks, is there any progress on updating safety standards to capture this variability? Or is a 25-year-old military man good enough representation? <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll answer the second part first. I will say no. A 25-year-old is a military guy is not uh, the best representation of the workforce. Um, there's been some work uh, from a few different groups, not ours, that have looked at the changing mass of the worker. So the average worker is no longer. When you talk about a 100-kilo worker, that includes all of their tools, all of their equipment, all of their you know, work boots and everything else they're wearing. Um, and so that no longer represents the average worker. Um, the, so they're, they're starting to push the testing um, to these higher weight limits. So in Canada, we have um, a different class of, of energy absorbers that's rated for workers up to uh, 175 or I believe 175 kilos, 210 maybe, um, the E6 lanyards. And so that allows a larger um, worker mass to be dropped. In other places, in the EU and in the US, they don't have that larger worker mass. They instead use those bigger lanyards to allow longer free fall distances. So there's each of these different jurisdictions has different rules. It gets quite confusing trying to sort it all out. Hi. Um, two questions. So the, the, the first is uh, uh, the easy one. Um, do you know what the force on the body is when a person is recreationally bungee jumping? Jump, jumping? I don't. Off the top of my head, I do not. Okay, second question. More, yeah. <laughs> more germane. Were, were you asking for yourself or for a friend? Uh, <laughs> just curious. Um, so on the um, inspection end of things uh, and the possibility, and I'm just you know curious about things like in addition to ultraviolet radiation damage and... Uh, potential for ozone and other kinds of uh, reactive chemicals. So there is a certification process, but do you know whether there is um, either legislation, A or B, is there uh, an underground economy in used um, lanyards? Um, I don't know that it's even underground. Certainly there is, you know, people get used lanyards all the time. When you're looking at somebody who's picking up a, you know, couple weeks temporary roofing contract or something else and they, they've been told they have to have fall protection and they're looking at making a few hundred bucks over that contract, if they can grab safety equipment for 50 bucks off Craigslist, that's what they're going to do, right? Um, so, no, and the other part is the thing that's that doesn't exist right now and, and we're pushing for is to integrate some expectation of how these things need to perform over time, not just how they perform brand new out of the package. So, all the ratings and everything you see on these systems are rated for, we just took this off the assembly line at our plant, and now we took it over to the drop tower, and we dropped it and tested it. Right? But they're not thinking about, well, they're, theoretically, they're supposed to be allowed, as long as they don't have weld splatter and stuff, they're supposed to be allowed for up to five years. Right? They're getting out in the workplace. They're getting wet. They might be getting moldy if you don't keep your equipment dry. They might be getting UV exposure. They're getting all these different things, extreme temperatures. How do they perform under all of this stuff? So there is some, there is a, there is an extreme temperature component of the CSA standard, Canada, good job, um, but there's not any of this other stuff, right? And, and again, that extreme temperature component is brand new out of the package. Thanks very much. Those um, videos are always quite powerful to me. Uh, I wondered whether, I mean, how, I would assume, I guess, in construction that there's always a sharp edge, and why not just advocate for the wire lanyard? Like, it seems like that's always a possibility. Uh, could be a naive um, yeah. interpretation, and why not, for, I guess, at least in those occupations, why not advocate for that? I, that's my stance, I guess. The second thing is, I wondered if those videos are in themselves educational and whether you've you know, had a chat with the Construction Health and Safety Association or I, I would think they could be quite powerful as a message to the workforce about the importance of wearing them and having them renewed. And, yeah. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll answer the first thing about the, the wire rope lanyards first. Um, absolutely. I, I think based on this result, I think there's some, some sectors where they really should be 
not looking at the, the web lanyards at all. Um, the wire rope, the I guess the argument perhaps against it, uh, I'm not, oh, I've used it, but I'm not a worker who uses it every day. Um, they're not easy to move around. They're heavy. They don't bend and flex in the same way, so then you end up with this big loop that's kind of stiff and hard to move around. Now you've got one extra point of connection, so you've got these heavy, clunky things. As, as you guys were passing them around, I heard them clunk on the table a bunch of times, right? Like, you've got to drag that around when you're working the whole day, and it's clunking against the back of your legs as you're walking because you've got your energy absorber that's hanging down your back, and then you've got the connection that's somewhere sort of below that to your wire rope. Um, so it's making it more user-friendly would, would go a long way to making it easier to adopt. Um, yeah, certainly these videos are useful in a lot of ways. So they're being used by, by the guys at BCIT. Um, that was part of the, you know, why we subjected ourselves to having this camera crew follow us around for the Discovery Channel. So it, like, it just went out on regular TV so people could see it. Um, WorkSafe BC has them, so we're sort of sharing them where we can. Um, and the same with the torn out lanyards, right, and the damaged things and looking at what can happen and the, the catastrophic failures and outcomes. That's a big help to showing that it's not just, you know, the, I think the best comment I got from the, the students, the ironworker students, after we were doing this testing was, you know, it, I, thought, I thought if I put my stuff on, then I'd be safe. Put my safety gear on, then that means I'm safe. And now I don't want to fall. Right? It, even the, the, when you're watching the drop mass and it gets stopped, it's a jolt at the end of it. And it's bouncing around and swinging, and then you look up at it, and you realize it's still like three meters off the ground. How do we get this, get this thing back down, right? So luckily on our drop tower, that's why we had that second level of planks, is that another student, you know, send up the co-op students, up they go, clamber up, hook things up, winch the thing back up, and off they go again. But if you're hanging there, you have somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes to get down from wherever you've fallen to, where you're hanging, um, or you, you are risking permanent injury or death because it's compromising your blood supply. Right? So if you have these leg loops, they've got to be on tight so that you don't do any damage to your sort of lower parts of your body. Um, but if they're on tight and they're doing their job, now they're cutting off circulation. So it's, you know, you've you got to find a way to get down from there, which is the next part. Hi, thank you for your talk. This is not on, is it? Oh, it is on, sorry. Um, and uh, just, I would talk to loops and legs and stuff like that. Uh, beyond uh, when you do get rescued, uh, you have, uh, your blood's been sitting for a while, and then it goes through and you have pocket shock and stuff like that. So it's like free climbing and put the standard loops for that. But um, also for the, all of these, the safety, the, the parts that actually save your life are all exposed. And they're getting welding spatter and all that stuff. And we talk about a you know a metal rope and all this stuff. Why are these not in a sheath? Why don't they have some sort of Kevlar sheathing on them? I, you know, it's light. It moves. You know, it can have. You know, it has very user friendly. Just another layer between that and the sharp edges between the the welding spatter between all that stuff. Level, why does that not exist yet? There there are some Kevlar lanyards that are supposed to be weld water resistant, and we yeah. tested those, and they didn't seem to do anything just, different just than Just on the these. outside of one of these. I mean, they, yeah, they, it has well, they actually just replaced, the right? They would just replace this with a Kevlar component. Yeah. Um, and so that didn't seem to do much of a difference. Uh, it's, all, it's, it's all cost in the end, yeah. right? So how much is somebody willing to pay? How often does it need to be replaced? If you put all these extra pieces and components in, how much is it going to add to the cost, and will someone still pay it? Right? It's, so really, at the end of it, Nobody should use any of this stuff. Use a self-retracting lanyard, lifeline, you know, those, those dog leash things. They're metal cables. They don't let you free fall as far. They put a brake on it, but they're really expensive. And so you have these other options because something is better than nothing, but it's, yeah, it's always that trade-off. We, we never like to think about the cost of human life or the cost of safety, but there's always an economic decision somewhere in there that's being made by somebody. It may not be you, but somebody's doing it. So I think um, this wraps up our, sorry, there's a question right behind me. <laughs> uh, with those uh, self-retracting lanyards you showed, in the image, is it connected to the, the steel girder? Is that what it's moving along? Uh, yeah, so it has a, they have a 
contraption that they make to connect it in. Yeah. So is it possible to use that on a, a residential site on a wooden beam, or is it only for? Uh, it's it's possible to use it on a wooden beam, but as soon as that wooden beam gets sheathed and platted, then you don't have that option anymore. And then following that, so you tested the rough and the, the sharp edges of metal, but did you test any any wood edges for no. residential? No, so we haven't done any work on the residential side of things yet. That's sort of, as we were looking at the, the stats particularly, it really flagged for us that the majority of these workplace injuries and falls are on the, what they call low-cost construction. So, you know, residential construction isn't actually low-cost in many of our minds, but relative to a giant tower, um, residential construction and low-height sort of four, six-story wood frame buildings, uh, that's, that's where most of the falls are happening. Okay, then. So please join me in thanking Dr. Sperry. Thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you very much.